Welcome back. We are on chapter three of Italo Calvino's Priscilla series, titled Death. Let's begin. This is the shortest chapter. <laughs> Death. The risk we ran was living, living forever. The threat of continuing weighed from the very start on anyone who had by chance begun. The crust that covers the earth is liquid. One drop among the many thickens, grows, little by little absorbs the substances around it. It is a drop island, gelatinous, that contracts and expands, that occupies more space at each pulsation. It's a drop continent that spreads its branches over the oceans, makes the poles coagulate, solidifies its mucus green outlines on the equator. If it doesn't stop in time, it gobbles up the globe. The drop will live. Only that drop, forever, uniform and continuous in time and space, a mucilaginous sphere with the earth as its kernel, a gruel that contains the matter for the lives of us all, because we're all arrested in this drop that will never let us be born or die, so life will belong to it and nobody else. So he's talking about the origin of life as the first living creatures had to be impossibly simple, so simple that you might not even call them alive. You know, they were basically these little crystalline structures, and they covered the globe, and without change, if there had been no evolution, that's all that there would have been, and all the creatures waiting to be, that the past dictates ought to be, maybe, are yet to be. Luckily, it is shattered. Each fragment is a chain of molecules arranged in a certain order, and thanks to the mere fact of having an order, it only has to float in the midst of the disorder sub disordered substance, and immediately around it other chains of molecules are formed, lined up in the same way. Each chain spreads order around itself, or rather, it repeats itself over and over again, and the copies in turn are repeated always in that geometrical arrangement. A solution of living crystals, all the same, covers the face of the earth. It is born and dies in every moment without being aware of it, living a discontinuous and perpetual life, always identical to itself in shattered time and space. Every other form remains shut out forever, including ours. So here's this question, right? So you have a crystal with well-defined form, and it gets destroyed only to be reformed again. Was it ever really destroyed? Right? If there's nothing unique about it, if there's something like it before and something like it after, was there ever death? You know, so what what can there death can death exist without originality, without uniqueness? That's the question. Up to that up to the moment when the material necessity for self replication up to the moment when the material repli sorry. <laughs> Up to the moment when the material necessary for self-replication shows signs of becoming scarce. Up to the moment when the up to the moment when the material necessary for self-repetition shows signs of becoming scarce, and then each chain of molecules begins to collect around itself a kind of reserve supply of substances, kept in a packet with everything it needs inside. The cell grows. It grows up to a certain point. It divides in two. The two cells divide into four, into eight, into sixteen. The multiplied cells, instead of undulating each by itself, stick to one another like colonies, or shoals, or polyps. The world is covered with a forest of sponges. Each sponge multiplies its cells in a network of full and empty spaces, which spreads out its mesh and stirs in the currents of the sea. Each cell lives on its own, and, all united, they live the unity of their lives. In the winter frost, the tissues of the sponge are rent, but the newer cells remain there and start dividing again. They repeat the same sponge in spring. Now we're close to the point, and the dye is cast. The sea will be drunk by their pores. It will flow into their dense passages, and they will live forever, not we, who wait vainly for the moment to be generated by them. All right, so you'll notice every paragraph ends with this same idea that the world is covered by a certain kind of life form which wants to use up all the available space and remain like that unchanging, but the creatures of the future are laying there in wait. We who wait vainly for the moment to be generated by them. Every other form remains shut out forever, including ours. But 
in the monstrous agglomerations of the sea's depths, but in the monstrous agglomerations of the sea's depths, in the vicious mushroom beds that begin to crop up from the soft crust of the emergent lands, not all the cells continue to grow superimposed on one another. On one another. Every now and then, a swarm breaks loose, undulates, flies, comes to rest further on, they begin to divide again. They repeat that sponge or polyp or fungus from which they came, from which they came. Time now repeats itself in cycles. The phases alternate, always the same. The mushrooms scatter their spores in the wind slightly, and they grow a bit like the perishable mycelium until other spores ripen which will die, as such, on opening. The great division between living beings has begun. The funguses that do not know death last a day and are reborn in a day. But between the part that transmits the orders of reproduction and the part that carries them out, an irreconcilable gap has opened. So here he's talking about the evolution of multicellularity and sexual life. He was talking about that in meiosis previously. Specifically, he's talking about slime molds. So in slime molds, there's an interesting conflict of interest emerges where these slime molds, they're unicellular creatures. These are the, the funguses which do not know death. Um, the funguses which do not know death and last a day and are reborn in a day. These are little amoeba creatures that swim around in the damp forest floor and they don't know death because they divide mitotically, right? They, they live and they die and they live and they die, but they don't know death because they're always the same. They're unchanging, and, and the, the two cells that come from the first cell are identical in a way, so you can say that there's no death. And so these little amoebas, they swim around on the, on the forest floor, and then some trigger happens, and they start to come together, some sort of stress, it starts to dry out or food gets low. And all these little unicellular fungus creatures, slime molts, they come together and they form a stalk. And at the tip of that stalk forms a head, a reproductive sexual head. And it turns into spores and the spores go out into the world. And, but there's this rift between the part that transmits the orders of reproduction and the part that carries them out. An irreconcilable gap has opened because the part that transmits the orders of reproduction doesn't get to go on, it dies. The stalk starves to death. The only individuals that get to go on are the ones that are sexual, the ones that manage to make their way up into the spores. And you'd think there'd be some conflict here. All of the original, originally identical slime mold unicellular creatures would want to be in that top half. They'd want to go on to the next stage. And so the evolution of multicellularity involved uh, a huge amount of cooperation and willingness to sacrifice by the vast majority of the cooperators. And uh, so that's a challenge. And, and with that challenge comes death into the world in a way that it hadn't been before. The die is cast. The die, um, hmm, what is it? The great division within living beings has begun. The funguses that do not know death last a day and are reborn in a day. But between the part that transmits the orders of reproduction and the part that carries them out, an irreconcilable gap has opened. By now, the battle is joined between those that exist and would like to be eternal and those who don't exist and would like to, at least for a while. Fearing that a causal mistake might open the way to diversity, those who exist derive from the confrontation of two distinct and identical messages. Um, mm. Fearing that a causal, a cause, or, yeah, no. Fearing that a casual mistake might open the way to diversity, those who exist increase their control devices. If the reproduction orders derive from the confrontation of two distinct and identical messages, errors of transmission are more easily eliminated. So the alternation of the phases becomes complicated. From the branches of the polyp attached to the seabed, transparent medusas are detached, which float halfway to the surface. Love among the medusas begins, ephemeral play and luxury of continuity through which the polyps confirm their eternity. On the lands that have emerged, vegetable monsters open fans of leaves, spread out mossy carpets, arch their boughs on which hermaphrodite flowers blossom, so they hope to grant death only a small and hidden part of themselves. But by now the play of crossing messages has invaded the world. That will be the breach through which the crowd of us who do not exist will make our overflowing entrance. What stays the same when everything else must change? 
The sea is covered with undulating eggs. A wave lifts them, mixes them with clouds of seed. Each swimming creature that slips from a fertilized egg repeats not one, but two beings that were swimming there before him. He will not be the other, he will not be the one or the other, but those of those two, but hmm. each swimming creature that slips from a fertilized egg repeats not one, but two beings that were swimming there before him. He will not be the one or the other, but those two, uh, sorry, I'm talking about fertilization. We did this all in the last video, right? So he, um, each swimming creature that slips from a fertilized egg repeats not one, but two beings that were swimming there before him. So you repeat both your mother and your father. He will not be the one, not just the mother, or the other, not just the father, but the two, uh, or the other of those two, but yet another. He will not be the one or the other of those two, but yet another, a third. That is, the original two for the first time will die, and the third for the first time has been born. Right, so sex and death are inexorably linked because with sex comes uniqueness, and with uniqueness comes the risk of ending. Right, so before with mitosis, you had a mother cell which gave rise to two identical daughters, and the mother perished but kind of didn't because she was both daughters. But now with sexual reproduction, the mother and the father are combined into their child, but at the same time, they, neither of them are the child. The child is a unique being, and all three of them death has become inevitable. If the invisible ex in the invisible expanse of the program cells where all the combinations are formed or undone within the species, the original continuity still flows. But between one combination and another, the interval is occupied by individuals who are mortal and sexed and different. Let's do that one more time. In the invisible, ex in the invisible expanse of the program cells, where all the combinations are formed or undone within the species, the original continuity still flows. What stays the same? What is continuous when everything changes, right? So, in the invisible expanse of the program cells, where the combinations are formed or undone within the species, the original continuity still flows. But between one combination and another, the interval is occupied by individuals who are mortal and sexed and different. So there is continuity. There is something that goes on forever and ever. This line between you and your parents and your parents' parents and your parents' parents. There is an unbroken chain of individuality which has stayed true and whole and unchanged. But that unchanged thing is so abstract, so immaterial, and the various instantiations of it, you, and then your mother, and then your grandmother, and on and on and on, each one of these is occupied by individuals that are mortal and sexed and different. So sex exists and individuality exists and all of this ending and suffering exists so that something beyond us, above us, or within us continues on, unceasing and unchanged. The dangers of life without death are avoided, they say, forever. Not because from the mud of the boiling swamps the first clot of undivided life cannot again emerge, but because we are all around now, above all, those of us who act as microorganisms and bacteria, ready to fling ourselves on that clot and devour it. Not because the chains of viruses don't continue repeating themselves in their exact crystalline order, but because this can happen only within our bodies and tissues, in us, the more complex animals and vegetables. So the world of the Eternals, has been incorporated into the world of the perishable, and their immunity to death serves to guarantee our mortal condition. Let's do that one more time. So the world of the Eternals has been incorporated into the world of the perishable, and their immunity to death serves to guarantee us our mortal condition. So there is something immortal in you that will go on forever, <laughs> or at least until all life ends. But this immortal thing is not you, and your mortality, your individuality, and all of the dynamic things that you do as a human, all of them are to ensure that that immortal thing continues to be immortal. But it requires your death. Hmm. 
So the world of Eternals has been incorporated into the world of the perishable, and their immunity to death serves to guarantee us our mortal condition. And our mortal condition serves to guarantee their immortality. We still go swimming over depths of corals and sea anemones. We still walk and make our way through ferns and mosses under the boughs of the original forest. But sexual reproduction has now somehow entered the cycle of even the most ancient species. The spell is broken. The Eternals are dead. Nobody seems prepared anymore to renounce sex, even the little share of sex that falls to his lot, in order to have again a life that repeats itself interminably. The victors for the present, are we, the discontinuous. The swamp forest, defeated, is still around us. We have barely opened a passage with b which blows our machete in the thicket of the mangrove roots. Finally, a glimpse of free sky opens over our heads. We raise our eyes, shielding them from the sun. Above us stretches another roof. A hull of, wor a hull of words we secrete constantly. As soon as we are out of the primordial water, we are bound in a connective tissue that fills the hiatus between our discontinuities, between our deaths and bursts, a collection of signs, articulated sounds, ideograms, morphemes, numbers, punch cards, magnetic tapes, tattoos, a system of communication that includes social relations, kinship, institutions, merchandise, advertising posters, napalm bombs, namely everything that is language in the broad sense. The danger still isn't over. We are in a state of alarm, in the forest losing its leaves. Like a duplicate of the Earth's crust, the cap is hardening over our heads. It will be a hostile envelope, a prison, if we don't find the right spot to break it, to prevent its perpetual self-repetition. The ceiling that covers us is all jutting iron gears. It's like the belly of an automobile under which I have crawled to repair a fault. I can't come out from under it because while I'm stretched out there with my back on the ground, the car expands, extends until it covers the whole world. There's no time to lose. I must understand the mechanism, find the place where we can get to work and stop this uncontrolled process, press the buttons that guide the passage to, following, to the following phase, that of the machines that reproduce themselves through crossed male and female messages, forcing new machines to be born and old machines to die. Everything at a certain point tends to cling around me. Even this page where my story is seeking a finale that doesn't conclude it, the net of words where a written, where a written eye and a written Priscilla meet and multiply into other words and other thoughts, where they may set into motion a chain reaction through which things done or used by men, that is, the elements of their language, can also acquire speech, where the machines can speak. Look at this machine. <laughs> it's speaking. Exchange the words by which they are constructed. The messages can cause them to move. The circuit of vital information that runs from nucleic acids to writing is prolonged in the punch tapes of the automata, children of other automata, generations of machines, perhaps better than we, will go on living and speaking lives and words that were also ours and translated into electronic instructions. The word I and the word Priscilla will meet again. So it got a little dark there, um, you know, with the the coming the coming age of the machine, where the the soft wet bodies become replaced by machine ones. But it's all still alive, right? It's all still death and rebirth, death and rebirth. The important point here in all of it is that life and death are intertwined, and what it means to be an individual is inexorably associated with what it means to be everything, and that there's all of these opposites that are unified. Life and death need one another. Inside and outside need one another. And by trying to empathize, you know, this last one, death, was about the entire arc of the Tree of Life, starting with the origin primordial soup all the way up to, you know, artificial life, automata machines. Throughout this entire arc, the point has been to try to imagine what it's like to be at any point of it. You know, we, we're so trapped in our human myopia, you know, what it's like to be me, that it's really easy, <laughs> or maybe it's impossible to imagine what it's like to be your next door neighbor, let alone the first unicellular bacteria or, you know, the robot overlords of the future. Um, but this is the role of fiction, to try to get us out of our own heads and 
to imagine what it's like to be someone beyond ourselves, because the truth is that we are that, you know, that we are connected to all of that, that when we end, we don't really end, we keep on continuing, and it's all connected, and I can get very wishy-washy, blah, 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 but I think it's really important to try to keep that in mind as we go about our daily life, and um, try to remember our roots and our future, and the continuities and discontinuities that go in between. All right, well, thank you for reading these Cosmic Comics with me. I hope you learned something, and uh, I'll see you later. Farewell.